joy comes with morning. I am morning. I am joy. I rise slowly, silently, as sweet-scented skies receive my all-embracing warmth, as tiny, swelling seeds whisper their joyous, joyous refrain. Welcome, welcome, they sigh. Welcome, new dawning day. Your rebirth is as our very own. Good morning. Welcome to Easter Sunday at Roncesvalles United Church. Now, how can you tell it's Easter Sunday? Well, it's the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. And also I'm wearing my white robe and also we have lilies and other Easter flowers around us. And also you probably had chocolate for breakfast this morning. We're so happy to be celebrating Easter Sunday on a recording with you. We hope that this Easter Sunday recording will fill you with the kind of joy that this very sacred Christian celebration is meant to bring. We have beautiful traditional scripture to hear. We have wonderful music to share and the Christ candle will be lighted once again. So welcome, welcome to Roncesvalles United Church on Easter morning. After the Sabbath, as the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb and suddenly there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes white as snow. For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has been raised, as he said. Come, see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has been raised from the dead, and indeed he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. This is my message for you. So they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to tell his disciples. Our Christ candle was extinguished on Good Friday to mark the death of Jesus on the cross. Today, we light it to mark Jesus' glorious resurrection and continual presence in our world. We'll light this candle, a symbol of this same joyous statement, every Sunday until Good Friday next year. Now, Please join me in our traditional Easter proclamation. One, Christians have shared every Easter Sunday morning for a thousand years. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed.
of this most sacred of Christian days. Christians in all places, Christians in all denominations, and Christians of all types and stripes. I mean, we have the Christians who believe that the tradition is everything, that Jesus died for our sins, died horribly on the cross, and was ro rose on Christmas Day, literally, as the Bible describes. And then we have Christians who take a kind of softer view. Maybe the Gospels aren't all the same, because this is more of a parable. It's a description of what happened to Jesus, more than a completely literal story. And then you get the Christians who think that, well, Jesus maybe wasn't entirely divine, but was a completely holy Middle Eastern prophet who lived in such endless and perfect communication with God that his true gift to the world was his holiness extended past his death. death. In any case, we are all celebrating Easter in some way. And what I wanted to talk about today comes with, well, a variety of titles. I tried to struggle with how to encapsulate what I want to talk about, and I came up with things like Back to the Bunnies, or Beyond the Bunnies. I also thought of Which is Your Christ, or Choosing Your Easter. I'm going to let you choose the title when I finish speaking. What I really want to talk about is exactly that. Choosing what Easter means to us. For some people, for sure, Easter is such a complex idea that celebrating the nature aspect of it just seems simpler, and it makes sense. And it does, after all. The title, the name Easter, comes from the name of a Germanic goddess, Istara. She was a goddess of spring and fertility. Isn't it interesting that our church fathers over 2,000 years never saw necessary to change the tradition of our most sacred day named for a pagan spring goddess? So celebrating Easter as the resurrection of life in spring is not only makes sense in the world around us, it is very traditional. The ideas of bunnies and chocolate are all part of that fertility, that renewal symbolism. But I think we miss out. I think we miss out if we don't really think for ourselves what this most sacred Christian day means. I think we miss out because we can either depend on what we were taught in the past that we've never thought of again, or never thought we had an opportunity to think of again, or what we feel in the present, which may contain a lot of things about Easter and the days that preceded it, that we find difficult. I will tell you that one of the only fights I remember having with my parents as a teenager was over Easter. It wasn't years earlier when they made me go to church wearing white gloves and a crinoline, though it might have been, because if there's anything that reminds us of the suffering of Christ, it was wearing a crinoline. Everyone who did it knows what I mean. What I objected to as a teenager was the concept of this loving God who killed his own son. I didn't get it. As a teenager, of course, we are questioning the world. Our world vision hasn't really formed yet. We're moving from the time of what our parents taught us and what our tradition suggests to a time of forming our own life view. So I had a lot of questions in that time about Easter, because my parents and my family were very church-going people. We went usually two or three times a week, and on Easter, more. My questions were things like, how come, given that there are so many instances in the Old Testament of God absolutely decrying child sacrifice, including the story of Abraham and Isaac, but also the story of a king who was condemned by God for sacrificing his son, in spite of all of those stories against child sacrifice, God chooses his child to be sacrificed as a way to somehow achieve a right relationship with humanity. I didn't understand that. I didn't understand how Jesus could preach a relational God and a God of love, and then all of a sudden the scriptures take this incredible turn. And God instead becomes the one who exacts duty and obligation and feels you and obedience to this extent that someone has to die 
to make things right. I didn't understand that. There were other parts of Good Friday and the Easter story that didn't make sense to me. Why is this idea that we have to have the sacrifice of Jesus to put us back into relationship with God, not speaking about the fact that all through the Old Testament, even from the time of Adam and Adam's transgression, God was always present with humankind. God was always working in the lives of people. God was always relationship, relational. So how come at the point of Easter, that relationship somehow needed to be mended? I didn't understand. Now, if you come from a place where those traditional stories and the way of understanding Jesus as having been sacrificed for our sins in love, then that's a good place to be. If that's where you find God and meaning and the care of God in your life, then that is a really good place to be. But for some of us, and for me, those stories weren't helpful. And so I did what a lot of teenagers do, or people who start questioning their faith. I refused to go to church on Easter Sunday. And can you imagine what that meant in my family? My idea of being hang on the cross was absolutely the kind of grounding and disparaging and upset and weeping that my parents engaged in because I questioned the traditions I'd been given. I think most of us have questioned tradition at some point. And for me, as I lived out my life as an adult, I began to think, is there another way to understand God? I felt an absence of the spiritual life in my world, but I knew that the stories I had been given didn't work for me. They didn't give me a good understanding of who God was. So when I went back through Christian history to see if there was a place for me there, I was stunned to find that Christians had never thought the same about the resurrection, or Good Friday, or anything else about the life of Jesus. Christians have always had different opinions and different ideas. The reason we brought forward one idea, Christ died for our sins, Christ died to bring us back into relationship with God, is simply because for most of history, there was kind of only one newspaper in town. There was only one church stream that was able to get its message out to people. So the ideas that were formulating in so many places, the differing opinions, ways of seeing God in the world, simply didn't get heard, and often were lost. It was when I came to Anselm of Canterbury in the thousands that I suddenly found the answer I was looking for. Anselm of Canterbury was the uh, arch, arch, did she? Anyway, was the arch, what do they have in England? They've got a, she said looking lazy. Archbishop. Archbishop, thank you. Uh, of England in the uh, early 1100s, Anselm of Canterbury had an ongoing legal struggle with the king of the time for who had jurisdiction over various parts of people's lives, the king or the church, the government or religion. That becomes very important. Anselm of Canterbury came up with this wonderful line about Christianity which became so meaningful to me. He said that the center and the foundation of Christianity is faith, seeking, understanding. Faith, seeking, understanding. What Anselm of Canterbury was saying, in fact, was we have a relationship with God. We have faith that there's a greater, a beyond, a hum of reverence, an unconditional love, an eternal relationship. And we seek understanding of what that relationship looks like and how it plays out in the world. Now, Anselm of Canterbury said he was seeking understanding because he wanted to rewrite some of the ways that the church had interacted with the government. But he also wanted to rewrite some of the foundational ideas of the church. For instance, the idea that was prevalent about Good Friday and Easter in the time of Anselm of Canterbury was humankind is in the grip of the devil. Humankind have sold our souls to the devil. The devil rules humankind. And Jesus' death is
is a necessary ransom to bring us back into God's realm. If anyone is hearing the words of O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Come, O Come, Emmanuel, that we sing at Christmas, and ransom captive Israel. That's where that comes from. The idea was that the devil had us in his grips, and God had to ransom us by sacrificing Jesus to the devil. You can see why people sort of got over that kind of theology, because it suggests, A, God negotiates with terrorists, Anson said no. And also, that the power of the devil is equal to the power of God. So God has to make a bargain to get us out of the devil's grips. Anson of Canterbury came up with this idea of faith-seeking understanding so that he could suggest that our understanding can change. And in fact, he brought in a new understanding of what happened in the death and resurrection of Christ. Anson's idea was that the devil had nothing to do with it whatsoever. What was happening was, we are hopeless singer, sinners. Jesus, God, is a fair judge. That sounds reasonable. God is very concerned with justice. So God, the fair judge, is deserving of honor and justice. And we have transgressed. So God, the fair judge, can exact some kind of exactitude. Okay, let me try to rephrase that. In a court case, when someone has been transgressed against, there is a reasonable compensation. Got it? Anthem, Anthem, Anthem of Canterbury said, we have transgressed against the honor of God. We have to have reasonable compensation to give God for this transgression. The reasonable transgression for our reasonable compensation for our huge transgression is the death of God's Son. That's where our idea of Jesus dying for our sins came from. To my mind, it was a great progression from we're all in the grips of the devil and God's got to ransom us. But it didn't necessarily speak to me a thousand years later. Now, that piece about faith seeking understanding opened doors. And I was able to look at what Anselm of Canterbury had given us and that had been followed through for a thousand years with a few little tweaks along the way, like Thomas Aquinas who said, well, it's not so much an, a, a matter of justice. It's not really a court case that's going on here. It's really that our sin has taken us out of right relationship with God and we need to get back into it, so that's why Jesus was killed. And Jesus had to be killed horribly, said Thomas Aquinas, because that's how much suffering our sin has cost. But basically, Anselm of Canterbury's idea was carried through for a thousand years. Okay, now I want to pause for a second. I want to ask you to picture something. Picture what the world might look like in 3021. 3021. Okay, we can't really picture what the world will look like, can we? But we can make some assumptions. We can assume that in 3021, people will be living very differently. People will be the same in their hopes and their ambitions, their feelings that they're not enough, they're looking for safety and security. But they're going to be living in very different circumstances. They're going to be living in many ways in a different world. 2021 is a pretty much exactly the length of time from now that Anthem of Canterbury lived in the past. So that's how different my world was when I was a teenager and a young adult. That's how different my circumstances were. And that's how different I felt I was able to use Anselm's idea of faith-seeking understanding to find a different understanding about the crucifixion and about Easter morning. And this is what I found. When I began to look at the life of Jesus, I saw that there is an abrupt change before, between Jesus' life and teaching and the crucifixion and the resurrection. The abrupt change is that Jesus does not, during the time that he teaches, tell people that they're hopeless sinners and God has given up on them. He doesn't suggest that they have fallen out of relationship with God and that something needs to be mended. It is simply so broken that some big atonement has to happen. 
Jesus does not say to people anything other than God loves you, you're accepted, you have a powerful spiritual kingdom within you, you are part of God's mission on, on earth, you are God's beloved, you have a right to be here, you don't have to listen to the voices of the world tell you who you are, listen to God tell you who you are. That's the message of Jesus. And that is where we take the abrupt turn of Good Friday, when all of a sudden we fall out of relationship with God and we become hopeless sinners. But what if that's not the way that we can look at that? What if our faith, seeking understanding, can take us in a different direction? What if we can see that what Jesus suggested in his life was that our relationship with God is transformational? It's not punitive. It's not obligation. It's not legalistic. And it's not all about an ancient sin that occurred. Maybe we have an opportunity not to live in the sins of the past, but to live in a transformation and freedom in the present. Jesus' entire message was about you can live a new life in God. You can transform your life with God. And ask anyone who's gone to an AA meeting, or come crashing to their knees through some terrible tragedy in their life and found that they were caught and held and found that there was a higher power to give their life to and found that there was a spirit within them that responded to that power, not in fear, not with a need for retribution, not in any kind of punitive relationship, but in complete communion and love. Jesus preached that message and he was killed for that message. Because as the Roman government and the hierarchy of the church were trying to tell people to stay small, to follow the rules, that only they had the answers, Jesus was preaching a new dawn for personal relationship, personal freedom, and the right to experience God fully in our own lives because we're loved. When I started to apply this idea of faith-seeking understanding in that way, it opened up a new understanding of Easter for me. The idea was that, yes, Jesus died on the cross, and in that I could see transformation too. In that I could see a parable for my own life, for the times when my life has led me into situations which are so painful, which requires so much letting go of what has gone beyond, which requires so much for me in terms of laying aside what no longer serves me, that it feels like hurting. And then there is the time of pause, when I simply rest and wait for the next thing to happen, and then there is the glorious transformation into new life. Faith-seeking understanding. My faith in God didn't actually waver. My faith in some of the traditional teachings of the church did. But I remind myself that Anselm of Canterbury has given us one of those traditional teachings in saying that Christianity is faith seeking understanding for each of us. We're going to see the Apostle Paul do it. We see every writer of the Gospel do it. Every writer of the Gospel reaches into their faith and interprets the stories of Jesus in their own way, reaches a different understanding. That's why they're all different. And that's the traditional call to us, not to be enslaved by ideas that may not lead us in the way that we believe God wants to go, but to bring into our lives our own interpretation, our own understanding, to form a relationship with God which is allowed to evolve. In that, there is freedom. In that, there is true relationship. We don't have to live in the dead bones that Anselm left behind him in his very good heart and his very good attempts to give us something useful. I remember the day I went back to Easter service with my parents. I will confess to you that I was 27 years old. There had been a lapse of 10 years. And my parents were amazed when I said, I want to come to church with you. They couldn't believe it when I entered joyously into the celebration. They were stunned as they remembered the pain they'd gone through ten years ago. Was this really the same person? And in fact, the answer is no, it wasn't. I had applied an 
ancient Christian tradition, just as we enjoy some traditions in our church. But I also brought in a new understanding, just as we have honeysuckle rose blade as our joyous Easter music. I had done exactly what we're called to do as truth of Christians. Not accept what someone else tells us, but enter into our own relationship and understanding with the death and resurrection of Christ, whatever that may be. To allow it to lead us to a new freedom and a deeper relationship with our God. To allow us to be restored to the traditions that we love, but perhaps to see them in a new way. Easter after this has become one of my most beloved seasons. And I honor Anselm of Canterbury and all who went before. By finding his way into a new understanding, he reminded me that the greatest tradition of Easter is indeed to find my way, to go beyond the bunnies, to see more than the nature story, not to be trapped in the past, but to be resurrected in my ideas, my understanding of God, and my enjoyment of my spiritual relationship with the God who leads me forward. Faith, seeking, understanding. Yeah, certainty is easier. But what a beautiful gift for the Easter season. We don't have to live in winter anymore. And our hearts are in the world. God offers us at every opportunity transformation, new experience, deeper relationship, and a glorious perennial Easter day. Care. As thorns give way to a crown, 
Hear our prayers for peace in all lands, for an end to our oppression and war, for respect for human rights, for justice, and end to racism. As tombs give way to gardens, hear our prayers for worries that keep us from flourishing in your care. We pray for those about us, with patina for children in care and their caregivers, for AJ and those isolated and lonely in residences and long-term care, for Verna and others alone in their homes, for Botne, for, their, for those in difficult relationships to find a way to go forward. As yesterday gives way to tomorrow, hear our prayers for the future that holds so much uncertainty. Thank you for the gift of faith which sustains us in this most weary of times and inspires vision of newness and hope. We celebrate your presence among us. Help us to share the good news this day. Amen. So, this man and his wife are driving to church on Easter Sunday morning, and all of a sudden they hear a thump in front of the car, and they stop. And they run out, and they look in front of the car, and they are splayed out on the highway is a dead rabbit. And worse than that, there's also an Easter basket with chocolate eggs spread out all over the road. And the man and his wife look at this in horror, and the man says, oh no, we have killed the Easter bunny. And his wife says, wait a minute. And she runs back to the car, rummages through her purse, comes back with her spray, and sprays the rabbit with hairspray. And the rabbit jumps up, grabs his basket and the eggs, and hops off into the forest. And the man looks at his wife and says, what was in that can? And she says, it says right here, guaranteed to revive dead hair. <laughs> Have a transitional. Easter, everyone. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, rest and abide upon us, everyone, now and forever. Amen. Amen.